In a park in London's East End, there is a memorial which bears the names of 18 children killed in an air raid. And I think the bombs fell somewhere around 11 o'clock in the morning, if I remember rightly. While I was standing there, the, the caretaker came out with the first of the bodies. These five-year-old children did not die in the Second World War, but in a much earlier conflict. In 1915, German Zeppelin airships appeared over Britain and, for the first time, began an aerial bombing campaign against a civilian population. See, it's the first time we'd experienced a war. And we didn't know what it uh, what was all about. You never knew, I suppose, when the raids were going to be on. And we didn't get the warnings that you had in the Second World War. When the Zeppelin raids begin, there is no home defence. Even as late as May of 1915, there's only 33 anti-aircraft guns in the whole country. This was the start of a two-and-a-half-year campaign, which claimed the lives of many hundreds of people and whose psychological effect was every bit as powerful as that of the Blitz of the Second World War. These really were weapons of mass destruction, frightening new terror weapons, and nobody was quite sure how devastating they were going to be. This is the forgotten story of Britain's first Blitz. Twenty years ago, the last German airship to be shot down over mainland Britain crashed and burned in this field. It was the evening time, of course, because they started coming over when we were getting dark. They didn't come over in broad daylight to be shot down. <laughs> My mother said, come and have a look at the Zepp going over the house. Loads of them were coming over those days, but they didn't all pass off their bungalow naturally. So when one did come so near, that she just said, come and have a look. They were firing at it when they came over Thornness, and uh, it obviously caught light at the bottom and just flew it up. Because we knew it would come down somewhere, and we found out the next day it would come down at Thepperton, and um, that's where we made for. 95-year-old Phyllis Rees was just six when, in 1917, she witnessed the destruction of L-48, a German Zeppelin airship returning home from a bombing raid on Britain. Nine decades later, a team of archaeologists specialising in the First World War have come to the Zeppelin crash site not far from the Suffolk village of Theberton. It is the first time in Britain a Zeppelin crash site has been archaeologically excavated. We've used metal detectors to re-establish where the main crash impact was, and that's where we're now working uh, over here. We've used the, the metal detectors really to establish where we've got the biggest concentration of small metal debris from the crash Zeppelin. On a June night in 1917, three British fighter aircraft attacked L-48, setting alight the airship's flammable hydrogen, sending the Zeppelin and her crew crashing to the ground. 
I can just remember the first look at it, seeing this enormous thing. It looked as if it filled the whole field up. The crash was the last gasp in a terror campaign that had dominated mainland Britain for the previous two and a half years. So the, these pictures were taken in 1917 by the Royal Flying Corps. Yeah. But you also get a sense from this, don't you, of how it, there's, there's a fairly confined area where it's all sort of crumpled up. Yeah, it's like a telescope it. shutting, isn't it, on the... Yes, absolutely, yeah. yes. I know it was very impressive. See, the whole thing charred. It was still in the form of a zip. It was a one huge charred thing, and we knew that the men, whoever were underneath it, wouldn't be alive. And all these bods hanging around here, who are these? These are civilians um, coming to see the site and the cordon of soldiers around it just stop people from pilfering the bits and pieces off the site. We know that there was a massive official salvage operation following each Zeppelin crash and that most of the debris was systematically removed by the authorities and much of what remained we know was salvaged by souvenir hunters. Ninety years later, only fragmentary evidence remains at the crash site. These are some of the more interesting artefacts that have been recovered throughout this excavation. We have good condition aluminium alloy, probably from the gondola, in very good condition given the acidic soil content. We have a fragment of geodetic structure here, the general framework of the, of the Zeppelin, again showing slight corrosion, but uh, for 89 years I think that's again in very good condition. This example here is our officer's cuff button, clearly showing the anchor, the imperial crown and the rope twist design, and the words extra fine, which is a standard stamping for all German transport and military buttons. And also you might just see on the back here, there is evidence of burning, extreme heat subjection. Finally, probably one of the most interesting things I've seen is a fired British 303 bullet. Very difficult to identify a date range of this particular type of ball round. But I think given the situation, given where it was recovered from, the depth that it was recovered by the metal detector, I, I, I'm pretty keen to state that this was one of the bullets that brought down L-48. L-48 was huge. Over 600 feet long, it was bigger than any battleship of the time. For the Germans, the loss of L-48 was the end to an era which had begun nearly two decades earlier. Three years before the Wright brothers lifted off at Kitty Hawk, the German Count Zeppelin was pioneering his rigid airship, a solid aluminium framework which was covered and filled with hydrogen, a gas that is lighter than air. Maneuverable and with a speed of up to 50 miles per hour, the airship was revolutionary. The great advantage of the rigid airship is that you can make it much larger, therefore you can carry more fuel, you can put in more power, and basically you can come up with a complete system that is capable of travelling a very long way. And the great strength of the rigid airship was its range the fact it could go a very long way compared to an aeroplane that even by 1914 could barely hop off the ground and get back home. A new and glamorous form of transport. By 1914, Zeppelins, as the airships were now being called, had flown over 100,000 miles, carrying 37,000 civilian passengers without incident. But even as early as 1908, science fiction writers like H.G. Wells foresaw the Zeppelin's potential as an instrument of war. And it wasn't long before the German military were taking an interest in the Zeppelins. The German Navy rapidly saw the advantages of the airship as a long-range reconnaissance platform. And the Navy saw the Zeppelin as the only way they could give themselves that long-range eye in the sky that would prevent their numerically inferior fleet being trapped by the British. The German Navy's fleet of airships were to be commanded by a young officer called Peter Strasser, 
seen here with the elderly Count Zeppelin. It was Strasser who saw the full military impact the Zeppelins could have, boasting that England can be overcome by means of airships. Soon after the outbreak of the First World War, the British Navy blockaded Germany, attempting to starve her into submission. The German Navy retaliated against British civilians, shelling the English seaside towns of Scarborough, Whitby and Hartlepool just before Christmas in 1914. But the Germans were to take a more audacious step the following month when they extended the conflict from the sea to the air. On the 19th of January 1915, two airships, the L3 and the L4, approached the east coast of England. While the L4 headed northwards, her sister ship turned south towards the seaside town of Great Yarmouth. L3 unleashed a cluster of bombs. No, it's just over here. At the Kitchener Road Cemetery in Great Yarmouth, Joan Roberts right. and her oh. son Christopher are paying a visit to the grave of Joan's great uncle oh, yeah. Sam. Oh, yes. oh, there it is. The family knew nothing of the grave's existence until a local historian it's recently right. discovered it. It's a bit different, doesn't it? Yes. Samuel Alfred Smith, who was killed by a bomb from a Zeppelin, January the 19th, 1915, aged 53 years. That night, Sam Smith became the first British civilian ever to be killed by aerial bombing. So my great, great uncle. So, so that's Samuel. That's Samuel, yeah. Right, and that is as well. At 8.25 in the evening, Zeppelin L3 dropped seven high-explosive bombs. It was the bomb which landed here, in the St. Peter's Plain area that killed Sam Smith. 72-year-old Martha Taylor also died. Three others in Great Yarmouth were injured that night. This is it. There we are, look. The first house in Great Britain to be damaged by a Zeppelin air raid, 19th of January, 1915. So Sam's workshop was just over there. In that gap there? Yes, because that's yeah. 16 and he was 16A. Hmm. And he came out of his workshop and stood at the gates and, and was hit by shrapnel. He was badly hmm. injured, his head was injured and eventually he was found and uh, declared dead on the spot. An hour later, the second airship, L4, approached the Norfolk coast just north of Hunstanton. 30 minutes later, it dropped its deadly cargo on King's Lynn, killing two people and injuring a further 13. The fact that people had been killed in their houses, in their streets, from the air, this was new. Science fiction writers like H.G. Wells had written about this, but now it was happening. This was the full horror of modern war, and it was quite a shock. The first two attacks on Great Yarmouth and King's Lynn showed just how ill-prepared Britain was for a war from the air. When the Zeppelin raids begin, you know, most of the, the kind of the targets are, are fully illuminated. Nobody had really seriously thought about air raid precautions, about how you how you deal with this threat. It wasn't until the summer of 1916 that a full blackout was ordered over London paralyzing the city by night. The whole idea of the German offensive against Britain, both surface ship and airship, was to demonstrate that, at its core, the British Empire was vulnerable. In fact, Winston Churchill, Britain's first Lord of the Admiralty, had anticipated the threat posed by the Zeppelins as early as 1910. And so just over a month after the outbreak of the First World War, Churchill authorized the bombing of the Zeppelin sheds in Germany, an event that was to make front page news. 
basically what they did was they carried uh, um, the, uh, the bombs in the cockpit and threw them over the side uh, when they got to their target. The successful, if primitive, bombing of the Zeppelin sheds caught the imagination of the British press. Three weeks later, another British airman, Flight Lieutenant Reggie Marix, went one step further when he actually destroyed an airship on the ground. But the whole idea that you could get into an aircraft of the day, fly 150 miles or so, and drop a bomb on what was in fact a strategic target at, at that time, is quite a significant step in, in thinking. A preemptive strike, if you like, we'd probably call it these days. And yet, despite the success of these preemptive strikes, the war on the Western Front was the prime focus of the military leaders and most aircraft were diverted to support the troops on the ground. In the spring of 1915, German Zeppelins continued to attack Eastern Britain with increasing intensity and a growing number of casualties. The attacks are a novel experience for British civilians. I mean, the last time that anybody, in a sense, had directly attacked civilians, you could argue, I suppose, is when the Dutch came up the Medway in 1667. And therefore, for some people, it's very, very frightening indeed. The Zeppelins attacked with impunity and, importantly for those on the ground, with little warning. We had uh, police round with whistles on a bike, and also rattles. When the raids came on, we, they used to get us out of bed, and we used to be taken downstairs to the kitchen and just sit underneath the table until the all clear went. Some of the advice given now seems truly bizarre. What to do in an air raid? Go in the cellar, and take your whiskey with you. A lot of people went over to the local coroner's court, which was also a mortuary, because they had reinforced basements there. But we didn't have any shelters, you see. Some of our houses did have the basements, which we could use. But uh, they always had the feeling that they wanted to be with other people. Uh, they'd come out into the street to do that. As the number of civilian casualties increased, indignant newspapers published photographs of the innocent women and children who had been killed. The public, angry and frightened, began to turn on the people meant to protect them. When Hull is bombed, it is said that um, army soldiers are, are beaten up on the streets of Hull because there is no adequate defence. There is certainly a case of a Royal Flying Corps a vehicle being stoned in Beverly after a, a raid a, a, on East Yorkshire. So there is this rising concern that the defences are inadequate. The problem with Britain's air defences at the start of the war was that the few remaining planes were old, slow, and couldn't operate effectively at the same altitude as the Zeppelins. The Shuttleworth Collection has the world's largest number of flying British aircraft from the First World War. In 1914, air defence was divided between the Army's Royal Flying Corps and the Royal Naval Air Service. When you look at a Zeppelin, this is a big thing. It's 600 foot long, 60 foot wide or so. And you'd think they'd be relatively easy to shoot down. But I think the reverse was certainly the case. This is intriguing, isn't it? Wire, wood and fabric. 
This is what made up a typical First World War fighter aircraft. I think what you've got to remember about the state of the Air Force is at the beginning of the First World War in 1914 is that the, the aircraft itself was only 11 years old or so. So everything is really very embryonic. Well, here we are, the business end, the office. So it's basically oh. plywood and canvas and wire. Not much protection for the pilot as well, as you can see. It's just a, a thin covering. So up at 18, 19,000 feet with a temperature down in the minus 20s, yeah. um, he's not going to be very warm. OK, looking forward, we've got the altimeter at the top. We have an airspeed indicator underneath, an ignition switch just at the bottom there, a level indicator. Organisation on the ground was virtually non-existent. You see um, squadrons being formed with different types of aircraft rather than single types of aircraft. Uh, you see uh, pilots uh, training themselves or paying for their own training. If the pilot's life was difficult on the ground, it was even worse in the air. It's a very basic environment. You're open to the elements, so you've got a 90 to 120 mile an hour wind uh, blowing around you. And uh, as you get up to height, temperature goes down two degrees per thousand feet. So up at 15 to 18,000 feet, they're down in the minus 15 to minus 20s. Coupled with that, at altitude, you've got lack of oxygen, it's reducing the power in the engine. Uh, lack of oxygen is reducing the motive function of the pilot as well, so you're not thinking straight. With their defences virtually absent, the Zeppelin attacks continued, the death toll rose, and London, for the first time, became the main target. On the evening of the 8th of September 1915, a single Zeppelin, the L-13, crossed the wash on England's east coast and headed straight for the capital. L-13 was commanded by 32-year-old Heinrich Matti, one of the most experienced and audacious of the Zeppelin captains. A skilled navigator, Matti had become infamous as a result of the impact of his earlier raids. He had even boasted to a reporter that he would bomb London three times in succession or perish in the attempt. At around 11 p.m., Matty dropped his first bombs at Golders Green in the north of London before heading down towards the centre of the city. David Warren is a tour guide who leads groups along the route of Matty's September raid. One of the more important parts of his tour is in Lamb's Conduit Passage in Hoban. Airship number L-30 came straight above us here and dropped a 50 kilogram bomb, striking a lamppost which killed Henry Coombs, an employee of the Gaslight & Co Company, outright. It blasted in the Dolphin Public House, stopping the clock at 10.40, and it's remained at that time to this day. The blast then blew its way down Lamb's Conduit Passage, damaging number seven and number 10, and setting those two buildings ablaze. Matty continued dropping bombs, heading towards his primary target, the textile warehouses around Bartholomew Close in the city of London. Aboard the L-13 was the biggest bomb yet used in Zeppelin raids. The L-13 was right on target to strike its main objective the soft goods centre just to the east of me, but avoiding St Paul's Cathedral that is directly behind us. Charles Henley, who was the fire brigade duty fireman in this muse at the time, heard a strange noise in the distance like the whir, whir, whir of an engine. Then all of a sudden, there was an almighty crash. And when Charles Henley came round, he looked around him and the square was an absolute shambles. Up there, Captain Leutnant Heinrich Matty was looking down. He said afterwards that within the funnel of the explosion of the first 300 kilogram bomb ever to be dropped on London, all the lights within that funnel disappeared. The raid left 26 dead and 87 injured. It also caused half a million pounds worth of damage, making it the costliest air raid of the First World War. Despite the fact that just 26 anti-aircraft guns defended the whole of London, their effects that night had worried Matty. 
He would later write to his wife, asking that a good angel will hasten to guard my ship against the dangers which throng the air everywhere about her. Monkham's Hall Hill, to the northeast of London, provides a clear vantage point over the city. It's here that the Great War Archaeology Group have come to investigate the remains of a First World War anti-aircraft position. This platform was one of the defensive positions constructed in a ring of iron around London. It was the first attempt to defend a city from an airborne attack. If this is the first air war that's ever been fought, mm. and therefore this is the first air defence system ever established, where do the guns come from? I mean, are they, are they made specifically to be anti-aircraft guns, or no. are they guns that are adapted from the Navy or something like that? I mean, I don't know the answer to that question. No, apparently not. Um, the whole thing is a matter of improvisation and working it out as you go along, and it seems these three-inch quick-firers um, as they were, were an adaptation of an ordinary artillery piece. These were supposed to be able to fire up to 18,000 feet straight up into the air. Now, I mean, maybe that was in optimum conditions and they right. didn't normally achieve that performance, but it seems occasionally they could, they could shoot that far. And if they're firing vertically, isn't the danger that stuff's going to come down mm. and land on them? The records suggest that there's quite a few casualties, uh, quite a few people killed, quite a few people injured by falling fragments of British anti-aircraft shells exploding in the sky. I mean, the anti-aircraft guns were not terribly effective in terms of shooting things down. They estimated after the war that you probably needed to fire 8,000 shells to get one hit. And, of course, a hit wasn't necessarily a kill. So Zeppelins, generally speaking, weren't shot down by the anti-aircraft guns. But this kind of ring of iron, which built up, and probably a tenfold increase, I think, altogether in the number of guns over the space of about two years, a real build-up in the firepower, it meant that it was increasingly difficult for the Zeppelins to get into London, which was their prime target. Ninety years on, the metal detectors can still turn up frightening reminders of that war. This time, an unexploded anti-aircraft shell. Excavations will have to stop while the bomb squad removes the shell. But the military had developed some less obvious ways of helping to combat the Zeppelin threat. The German Zeppelins would use radio a lot, and this meant you could find out where they were by, by the direction-finding technique, DFing as it was known. If it was a radio source with German naval codes in the air, it was pretty obviously a Zeppelin, and you could track them, and they were tracked. You might even be able to read the codes of where they were going and what they were doing. And it was often said that the British knew where a Zeppelin was better than its own crew did. In addition, the airship was beginning to reveal its own fatal flaw. In France, a low-flying Zeppelin had been turned into an inferno by anti-aircraft fire. With no parachutes, the crew were burnt alive as their airship fell. Despite these dangers, by 1916, the number of raids over Britain significantly increased. My mother and all the other neighbours were very, very annoyed to think that a big thing like that should be allowed to come across London. In terms of the anger, you start getting anti-German riots in the East End. For example, there's an there's anti-German riot in Stoke Newington. There's stories, for example, of Dax hounds being stoned in the streets, this kind of thing. Anybody who has a German name, their premises is going to be targeted. The shopkeepers, of course, were the ones who were the targets. They were hounded out as quickly as possible. Uh, 
And of course, this made a difference for shopping because you miss their shops anyway. The Germans thought to assess the impacts of their raids by interrogating captured British servicemen. British officers who are captured tend to say that these are of no military value, they're not hitting, hitting military targets, they're, they're futile, a, a waste of time. But what's interesting is that ordinary British soldiers who are interrogated by the Germans will tend to say that they've heard from their mothers or their wives or their sisters or whatever that they, these raids are in fact having a great impact on morale at home. In March 1916, the British guns started to have some success when the L-15, damaged by anti-aircraft fire, was forced to ditch in the sea off the Kent coast. But it was aircraft from the newly created Home Defence Squadrons which were to have the biggest impact in Britain's battle with the Zeppelins. In the summer of 2006, the standard of the RAF's 39 Squadron was laid up at St Clement Danes, the Royal Air Force Church in London's Strand. The squadron has been disbanded after 90 years' service. Formed in May 1916 as one of four home defence squadrons, its purpose was to defend London from the Zeppelin threat. It was to have a dramatic impact on the aerial war over Britain. One of its first pilots won the Victoria Cross for his action against the Zeppelins. Lieutenant William Leif Robinson became an overnight hero when, on the 3rd of September 1916, he shot down the first German airship over British soil. Leif Robinson flew close to the airship and fired a number of rounds into its hydrogen-filled bags. As these contemporary photos show, it sent the SL-11 plummeting to the ground, killing all of its crew. For his action, Leif Robinson was awarded the VC. But the real breakthrough was technological. He was using newly developed incendiary bullets, which burned as they were fired, igniting the highly flammable hydrogen in the airship. The late summer of 1916 should have been the high spot of the Zeppelin offensive. They carry out some mass attacks, 16 airships on one occasion, the biggest ever. Um, but the British have the incendiary bullet. Now the fighters, which have got the organisation to get themselves in more or less the right place, with Zeppelins illuminated by searchlights, are able to fire large numbers of explosive and incendiary bullets in a, in a, a very nasty mix into the gas bags of the Zeppelins. And it has a tremendous impact. So there's stories of people coming out into the streets, dancing with joy, singing. You know, somebody's playing the bagpipes, it's reported in one place. The loss of the SL-11 was felt hard by the airship crews in Germany. None more so than the now notorious Zeppelin commander, Heinrich Matti. He wrote to his wife, the war is becoming a serious matter. It is my earnest wish that you be spared this most heavy of sacrifice for the fatherland and that I may remain with you to surround you with love as a garment. On the night of the 24th of September 1916, Germany launched a 12 Zeppelin raid against Britain commanded by Heinrich Matti in L31. The airships were met by heavy resistance from British defences. The first victim was L-33, which, having dropped incendiary bombs on the east end of London, was hit by anti-aircraft fire. Losing gas, she was forced to land in a field in Essex. So little hydrogen remained that the crew were unable to destroy her before surrendering. 
The British forces even managed to salvage one of the engines for later use. All of the crew of the L-33 survived the crash. They were the lucky ones. For that same night, Matty and his crew up in L-31 watched in horror as they saw their sister ship, the L-32, burst into flames and plunge to the earth. L-32 had been hit by the new incendiary bullets and crashed here at Great Bursted in Essex. Because of weight restrictions, the Zeppelin crews were forbidden to carry parachutes. All of the crew died in the crash. The pilot who had shot the airship down was Lieutenant Frederick Sowery, also of 39 Squadron, seen here with VC winner Leif Robinson. When Matty was asked by reporters in Germany whether, in the event of being attacked, he would burn or jump, he replied, I won't know until it happens. In L-31, Matty and his crew were filled with a deep sense of foreboding. It is only a question of time before we all join the rest. If anyone should say that he was not haunted by visions of burning airships, then he would be a braggart. It was to be just a week before his dark fears were to become realized. On one particular night, my father came and picked me up from underneath the table, took me up to the front door, lifted me up. From the front door, we looked due north, and there, was this Zeppelin coming down in flames. What Jack Brown saw that night was almost certainly the flaming remains of Zeppelin L-31, with Heinrich Matty and his crew on board. L-31 crashed in a mass of flames here at Potter's Bar in Hertfordshire. Matty and his entire crew perished in the crash. The downing of L-31 was carried out by 2nd Lieutenant Walston Tempest of the by now famous 39 Squadron. Tempest described the final moments of the airship. I saw her go red inside, like an immense Chinese lantern. When Matthew's uh, L-31 is shot down by Tempest uh, in, in October of 1916, uh, because he has this fear of burning, Matthew jumps. And there are these famous pictures of the imprint of the body where it landed in the field. He was still alive just when they found him, but he died almost immediately afterwards. At the funeral of the crew of L-31 at Potter's Bar in Hertfordshire, the last post was sounded. The Zeppelin commander's coffin bore the simple inscription Commander Matty, died on service, October the 1st, 1916. Back in Germany, the news of Matty's death was greeted with disbelief. As one officer wrote, with him, the life and soul of our airship service went out too. The fact that the British are able to bring down the man who's generally recognised both by the British and the Germans as a kind of the ace of aces when it comes to Zeppelin commanders, of course, is highly significant. And coming on top of those earlier successes uh, the, the month before, it really does mark the end of the, uh, pretty much of the Zeppelin threat. But head of the Naval Air Service, Peter Strasser, was not about to give up. He ordered a new flight of super Zeppelins, the Height Climbers. The original advantage that the Zeppelins had was their superior operating height. Once British aircraft could reach that altitude, the airships became easy targets. To regain their advantage, the Zeppelins needed to fly even higher. And so by 1917, the first 
uh, of these high-flying Zeppelins was delivered, and the Germans try to exploit that. Unfortunately, if you fly high, you have oxygen problems, the crews go, get intoxicated, they go slightly mad, in fact, from the effects of, of no oxygen, you freeze, because you haven't got any heating systems, you can't see the targets quite often, let alone hit them. You can't stay up there forever. And when you come down as you approach your bases, or as you get even more lost because you're flying so high, then you become vulnerable again. It turned out to be a blind alley. So vulnerable were these new airships that L-48, which crashed at Theberton in Suffolk, was shot down on its very first bombing raid over England. I don't think we hoped there'd be anyone survive. I think there was a sort of feeling that uh, they'd come over to bomb us, so that if we'd got them first, we were pleased about it. That was how you looked upon the war. I mean, you don't particularly want them sailing over you and dropping everything and getting away with it. But even as the Allies toasted their victories over the downed airships, the Germans were about to unleash their new terror weapon, the bomber. And the Gotha was the first bomber with a range to reach England. The first raid uh, by heavy aircraft is in May of 1917. It's on Folkestone. And you get a, a lot of public indignation. One of the great shocks for, for the British really is that aircraft will arrive in daylight and therefore, in theory, they can see their targets that much better and do that much more damage than the Zeppelin. The first daylight bomber raid on London was on June the 13th, 1917. Well, I think the, the bombs fell somewhere around 11 o'clock in the morning, if I remember rightly. Jack Brown was six at the time, at school in Poplar, in London's East End. Our teacher said, oh, well, let's have some uh, airway drill, which consisted of pulling down the flap of the deck desk and getting underneath, which we did. And of course, we no sooner got underneath it than all the glass and everything fell in, and there was smoke and fumes and all sorts of things around the place. A single bomb hit the roof, passing through two floors before exploding in the infant class next door to where Jack was sitting. It's all silent in my memory. I don't remember a bang as such. Whether the bang deafened me or what, I don't know. I, I, even, even when I remember the glass all coming in and, and smashing down all over the place, I still don't associate sound with it. But I remember there was no panic, no fear, because it was, it was so new and so sudden and everything that the, uh, the children were just bewildered, I think, and stunned. So then we walked out into the playground. While I was standing there, the, the caretaker came out with the first of the bodies. In all, 18 children from the school died in the attack. Another 37 were injured. Then afterwards, when I got home, my mother came tearing down the street with one shoe on and the other one in her hand. Always remember her now. Tearing down. And of course, um, I don't know, she, she just stopped and looked at me. What happened after that, I don't remember. Andrew Hyde's uncle was one of the children killed by the bomb. Five-year-old George Hyde is buried along with the other children in a mass grave not far from the school. Well, the local reaction obviously was, was just one of absolute devastation and um, the, the, Probably most of the local area had children at the school. It was a large school. They just couldn't believe it. The fact that uh, uh, Germans could come over and, and kill with indiscriminately and without any resistance. Well, the next morning, 
we went back to the school again. And when we got there, Mr. Denner, the headmaster, was there with the school register. And he stood there reading the names out from the register. And I remember that as he stood there and the, and the, the names came out, he was crying. He was also a big man, so it was making a big impression on me that um, a man of his stature and his importance in my life, to see him actually uh, brought to this uh, stage was um, quite a shock. Thousands thronged the route of the children's funeral procession. It was the biggest London's East End had ever had. Condolence cards were given to the families. In addition to the more innocent cards which were presented to uh, each of the victims' families was a more general card which uh, quite starkly stated in memory of the victims of the Hun death dealers, which really fairly reflects the mood of the people at that time, especially at that stage in the war, and the total hatred towards which the, the Germans and the Kaiser were held. Many subscribed to a fund for a memorial to the children which still stands to this day in a park close to the school. Public indignation remained high. One chap who was recorded as saying that fair fighting between men, one doesn't mind, but making war on women and children is, just isn't right. It's the work of beasts. The Upper North Street School almost certainly was not the bomber's target. The um, bomb aiming in those days must have been pretty primitive. And of course, instead of hitting the docks, they hit the school. Uh, a lot of um, propaganda at the time, all the newspapers and everybody was led to believe or, or to assume that they come over deliberately to, to bomb that school. But of course, um, that sort of thing still happens today, doesn't it? Compared to the carnage of the Western Front, the number of casualties from Britain's first blitz was tiny. But the terror visited upon a civilian population was every bit as horrific as occurred 25 years later in the Second World War. First the Zeppelins and then the Gothas created a template for future bombing campaigns where civilians would become integral targets of war. <laughs> 